Hello everyone, it's Imogen again. Um, I've been asked back by Isaac Blake at the Romani Cultural and Arts Company um, to give you another video tutorial and um, I thought a lot about um, the last set I did, the three processes to get you from yarn making to frame building to weaving a small rug. Um, and I thought um, a process that I won't really enjoy sharing with you is um, spinning and specifically spinning on a Navajo or Diné style spindle which is here. So um, this is the one that I recommended, it's um, a brand called um, Schacht and this is a traditional style Navajo or Diné um, in their own language, spindle. Um, before I do the tutorial I want to talk to you a little bit about um, cultural awareness and respecting um, indigenous culture um, and this is interesting to talk about from um, a Romani point of view um, because we ourselves um, our cultural heritage is um, some or dislocated or hidden or because of our journey out of India across time um, has adapted and changed and moved through the regions we moved through as a people and part of my enjoyment as a textile um, craftswoman and also I'm, I enjoy research but I also enjoy understanding the history of the skills that I have um, and for me there are lots of different styles of spindle okay there's very small ones there's ones that you spin in a bowl and they're all when when, they, when you look at them in sort of around the world there's, there's the Turkish spindle um, bowl spindles that are more Eastern um, European and Slavic um, spindles that are um, specific to Scotland called Jelligans and all of them are um, smaller and um, produce thinner yarn um, and are almost for use on the go if that makes sense so not necessarily always but they have the quality of being small and portable and that you can also spin as you walk and there are a lot of um, archival videos of um, lots of different peoples um, using those spindles in a sense of being portable. Um, I'm also interested in how, the, how you use your body in craft and when I learned the Navajo spindle um, I actually learnt it from watching elders, indigenous elders on YouTube because there are some incredible videos of them spinning, um, specifically Clara Sherman and what I'm going to do is like with every video that I do I'll put a link on my blog post to all the references and um, videos that you might want to look at for your own research but also to see how it's done by original elders, um, in, indigenous Navajo, Diné elders because for me it's incredibly important to respect your teachers and they are my teachers um, in that. So um, there's also an incredible book um, by Linda Peet Teller and her sister um, who are Navajo weavers and this is really important to say so they talk about um, cultural appropriation and what that means that's when someone from outside the culture takes um, a culturally identifiable craft and co-opts it and then doesn't give credit um, now they're very clear that tools and techniques are not cultural appropriation. The cultural appropriation, specifically um, for 
Linda Pete Tiller and her sister and their community and how they see it is the design that is woven has huge cultural significance in terms of the shapes and how the actual design is rendered. It has spiritual significance, it has cultural significance, family significance, and um, it's tied into the personal experience of spirit. It's, a, it's prayerful. And um, I think that is so important to acknowledge that spinning and spindles and weaving and looms have been part of humanity and culture and continue to be so and will always be so and they in themselves are not um, able to be appropriated negatively um, in a way that a design and a very specific pattern um, that is completely identifiable as belonging to not only um, that nation or that clan but that family and that specific weaver the design is their personal language so I want to be very clear about um, how I have researched the use of another culture's tool design and how appropriation to a Navajo style is not in the spindle or in the yarn that's spun on that spindle, but in the rendering of a design that looks exactly like a Navajo design, only it wasn't woven by a Navajo person. Now that is questionable and not encouraged. Um, that being said, the Navajo style spindle is also um, a type of spindle that can be called a, a lap spindle, a hip spindle or a floor spindle because it sits on the thigh and the lap, it's level with the hip and it also is in contact with the floor. So I'm honouring this as a Navajo style spindle, It was this was not made by a Navajo person, um, it is in the style because it's recognisable. Um, I also have a beautiful um, spindle um, made in walnut by Pete and he has made it so that the wall, this is called a wall, W-H-O-R-L, wall, and it helps the spin. Um, you can take it off and it transports a lot easier. Now this um, was around £42 and this one is around £37. So um, you can see how the wall stacks up underneath. Um, I'm actually talking to him about how we can maybe make this so it screws down, so we so it's easier to travel with, um, because you might not want to, you know, like with a smaller spindle, um, walk around spinning with it. Obviously, you need to sit and spin with this, or sit on the floor, or sit on a chair, um, but you might still want to travel with it. Um, so you slide it back on, and then you just give it a slight twist. And because the shaft is tapered, it just it like really nicely sets itself. So I'll show you, I'll give you a demonstration on this as well. But this is the one that I recommended um, in the first set of tutorials to buy. So some of you might have already bought yourself one of these um, for practice, and it's light. And it's, this is the one that I learned to um, spin on. So I'm going to demonstrate on this. But so I just wanted to be really clear about um, using another culture's um, the name of, of a tool. Oh, it's also known as the Southwest Spindle in America because of the Southwest um, United States where the Navajo um, people um, are um, to some extent. I know they're in other places and, and on reservations in other places, but um, that's also so. Navajo Spindle, Dene Spindle, Southwest Spindle, Lap Spindle. Hip spindle, floor spindle. So there's six names for this spindle, depending on how you want to call it. Um, another adjacent um, thing to note um, 
because I'm making this video for the Romani Arts um, Cultural and Arts Company as someone with Roma heritage. Um, my mom's family are Romani. In my um, research and um, genealogy, um, I've also had DNA analysis and um, spoken with a lot of other family members um, in the UK and in America. And we all seem to have a common link with First Nations people in our blood. Um, and for me, my First Nations link is Choctaw, um, the Choctaw tribe um, of Oklahoma. Um, and I have family members there. Now those family members also have, we have the same um, ancestry. So we have British Romani. Um, my family are the Drapers and the Coopers. And my um, great grandmother was Sarah Cooper who married into the Drapers, but her mother is Kaiser Cooper. And um, she um, had 14 children <laughs> um, in the late 1800s. And so I'm related to a lot of British Romanese. Uh, so hello cousins. <laughs> it's really nice um, to be able to talk about this. Um, so the cousins that I've met, um, mostly online because of times we're living in um have this connection to uh first nations people uh, as cousins as well so my choctaw cousins um are over in o oklahoma now i need to talk about this because because roma um history is somewhat um hidden um and i've talked about this before um for Roma Holocaust Memorial Day, Roma Genocide Memorial Day. Um, you know, our families um, sometimes assimilated, sometimes hid their identity, sometimes changed their names, and um, finding out now um, in the time that we're living in um, where it's somewhat safer, that's a difficult word to use, but um, to, to say, yeah, I have Roma heritage, I'm a Romani. British Romani woman, um, you know, in the 1940s, that wasn't something um, my family was talking about. So now we can talk about it. Also, finding out um, that I have First Nations Choctaw cousins, and I also have that in my um, my own DNA analysis, um, and then my cousins. And we all work, worked out, like, we have this convergence point where there was a moment in history where Roman, British Romani people were taken to America um, as indentured slaves. So um, this typically would have been young Romani men um, who were taken by the British crown to America during um, the Wars of Independence and used as indentured slaves. So an indentured slave um, has an indentureship to the crown for seven years. So during that seven years, they're property of the crown. So anything they do or are told to do during that time um, is um, not of their own free will because they're enslaved. And I think this is not talked about. Um, I've only talked about this um, informally with cousins. Um, but in the context of craft and that I'm using a Navajo spindle, which is another First Nations um, people, I think it's important to talk about this at this point because this is an area of Romani um, history that um, needs to be addressed and, and talked about just for our own understanding of who, who we are and why why we are um, and what we've experienced. Um, so, <laughs> um, 
I'm going to put some links to some lectures on um, for, specifically for me. So if you're related to me, <laughs> which is quite likely if you're a member of the British Romany community and you have Drapers and Coopers um, and Cox as well, um, yeah, uh, that you'll it's quite likely you have Choctaw um, First Nations heritage, and so I'm I'm really keen to explore that more, in more depth. And what that means in terms of craft. Um, so um, I'll put, I'm going to put some links to some really interesting uh, lectures that I found on YouTube that helped me with my research. Um, and also that that as an addition in the background as well, where Romani people began their journey um, across North India, um, Iran, as it was Persia then, and up through the continent and um, there are also um, nomadic markers um, for Bedouins and Berbers and um, Belush people all of those people are desert nomads um, who are weavers and are very well known for their weaving now that is something that I want to investigate as well because um, there are there are markers for many Romani people on, on DNA projects and, and genealogy projects um, that are tied to these tribes because of, of the movement of the, of the Roma through time really and I, I find that really interesting and I think if um, there's a way to um, understand craft from, from these places that Roma have walked but also have been sent to and then brought back from you know there's a, there's a there's a way to um, experience um, intangible cultural heritage and difficulty and healing um, by using um, the hands to to try and process that in some way and so that is my intention um, with respect to those cultures um, that as a Romani woman with this heritage it, it just it, it, it gives me a feeling of connection and a way to understand um, who we are through our experience and and if I can put that into artwork or craft work or videos like this um I hope that's communicating something of what has been lost because we're walking around not really knowing the truth about certain aspects of our heritage and our blood so that is my hope in uh in talking to you about these things so we have we have a rich heritage um we have difficult heritage but it's all our heritage so um, I want to talk about that um, before we even start using the spindle so I'm going to put all the links um, to um, online tutorials, online resources, conversations with elders, lectures into craft um, and just really if that if that feels like something that is interesting to you um, more than happy to share that I think it's really important shared information is really important so <laughs> that being said um, I'm gonna sit up here so that I'm gonna take a couple of angles um, so you're gonna see the, the floor spindle in action I'm gonna talk you through it um, I really want you to feel like it's something you can try um, like any tool it's um, something that you have a relationship with and you you develop your own um, style of spinning. So um, I went to a lovely workshop um, a few years ago run by um, Weaver, uh, Christabel Balfour and Jessie Mason, spinner, and um, she talked at length about the signature of the spinner. It's like your handwriting. It's individual to you. It shows your mood. It shows your rhythm. Um, and I really took a lot from that um, understanding that we could all have the same tool but through our body and through our feelings 
um, will express um, our signature spin and our handwriting spin. It's a language. Our craft is a language. So, all that being said, I love I love making, so I'm very passionate about this, so I hope that's all okay. Um, like I said, I'm going to link everything in my blog, go and have a look, um, find me on Instagram, ask me any questions, I'm more than happy to answer questions on these things, and uh, enjoy. <laughs> okay, see you in a second. Get a cup of tea. Always, always get a cup of tea and uh, it makes everything so much more enjoyable. Okay, see you in a moment. Hello everyone, so this is Imogen um, and I am presenting for Ver Navajo, Dine Spindle, also called a lap, hip or floor spindle. Now, um, first of all, you need your spindle. As a beginner, I would recommend you get yourself a bowl. Um, this is just a simple wooden bowl. Um, has a nice base. It's not too small because you need it just as a guide to um, keep your spindle in place while you're learning. When you've learned, you won't need this, the bowl. But for now, I'm going to recommend that you get yourself a bowl about this size um, or a little bit bigger. Too small and it'll just tip up. So, to get started, we need to add something called a leader, which is just a piece of um, yarn. This is linen, and it's about two uh, lengths of the actual spindle. That's just a rough measurement, or hand-to-heart measurement. Um, this is to get you started. Um, I actually cut mine, so I tied it back together with just a big knot. So, you wrap it around as close to the base as you can, just a couple of times. And then wrap it again, again around, up and over, and then tie about three knots. One, two, three. Because what we don't want is it spinning round and round, we actually want to catch. And then I'm just going to wind it a little bit like this. Right, that's nice and firm. Now, pop that on the floor. So the point of this is to start off your yarn. But just for now, I want you to follow along with me. We're just going to look at the hand movement. We're not, gonna, we're not even going to worry about this. I'm just going to hold it in my hand, but we're going to just deal with the spindle. Because it's here on your hip. And your hand needs to go like this, like this. So it's always like that. Not like this, because there's no there's no stopping it. This acts as a break. Okay. Now, everything happens at the tip. This is where the spin goes into the yarn. Ooh, at the moment, I just we're just looking at the hand technique. Okay. It's so simple. I'm going to do it really slowly. You pull it back, catch it, take it back forward, okay. Again, don't worry about this. When you speed up with it, it almost looks like a kind of, I don't know, it's just a very gentle wave motion, but the thumb has to stay here. Spin back, spin, back, spin, back. You can make the hand movements large just to show you the actual, so you can use your whole hand and you're, it's always in contact with your leg and it's always in contact with the bowl or the floor. If you were sitting on the floor, the spindle would just be at a deeper angle. Like that. If you want it really high, I mean, I'm sitting on a normal sort of chair height and you want it at this angle. But it could be at a wider angle. If you were sitting on the floor, it's fine as well. So one rotate, one spin of my hand 
the wall makes it rotate more times. So also my hand, it, it forms this triangle. So the spindle's been pulled back and this is a break. And then I take it forward and it's never gonna, like it's not got, it's not gonna just fly around. It's, it's controlled by that little triangle and the fingertips here. So when I catch it with my thumb, I take it back. The area of my thigh I'm working on is from here to here. So I start here and I pull it back. So I'm just working it up and down my thigh and then it becomes this wonderful rhythm. One of the best ways to learn, and how I learned from watching Navajo um, spinners on YouTube, um, was literally just to watch their hand technique. Watch it. And having your thumb here is the most important part of this technique. And when you get your confidence, you can, you know, feel into it now. Let me just let all that spin go out for leader. <laughs> So we can start actually using um, some yarn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wind this on a little bit more down the bottom. And your leader is something you just can tie extra onto because when you, when you finish spinning you end up cutting a little bit off as you go every time you make a skein. Um, but for today, I just want you to get to grips with this and, and learn the technique. So you want you want it around like that's the tip and about that much hanging over the tip. Don't want meters and meters because you can only spin to your arm length here. It's about doing small sections, small sections, small sections, not about doing meters and meters and meters. And I'll explain why in a second, okay? So get the leader on your spindle, find yourself a little bowl. Find yourself a good seating position and just start practicing that technique. Okay, so now you've got your spindle and your leader, we need some wool. So this is the roving that I'm gonna be using. This is my South Downs and it's already been cleaned. And I'm gonna, each one of these I can strip into four. So I'm gonna split it in two and just pull. And then I'm going to split this in two as well and pull. So this is called roving. Now, you don't want your roving too thick because of the style of yarn that you're going to be spinning. So in a lot of the techniques, I've seen the elders take their roving and then just very gently pull on it. Not so much that it separates, but what you're doing is you're sort of finding that, that, do you see that? That's the bounce in the wall. When it's been carded and combed through a machine, like this this has been done um, in Cornwall at the Natural Fibre Company, so it's been through an industrial machine, so it's sort of stretched it and fixed it. What we want is when we spin, we want to get that bounce back in it, so we're just going to, like almost hardly any but just that little tiny bit of separation, you can hear it. Also, if you find any old bits of um, grass or moss that's it's been cleaned, you just pick it out. So, I'm put it on the floor, clean that up later. So, I don't know if you can hear that. So, we're gonna do that as we go along, and. The, this is the sort of size we're going to do at a time. Like, it, it's a bit longer than my arm, but we'll just do it as we go. So to start, you take your roving, you take your leader, and you put them together, and you make an over knot. Like that. But they're now attached. When we get to the end, this is where you end up losing some of your leader, because you just kind of find that. So get started, 
pinch your yarn maybe an inch above where you've knotted it and we're going to start off with the technique the lead is on there's a there's no movement there like it's quite nice and tight And that spin is travelling into here. Do that bit. We want we want the spin to jump that knot and go into this part here. You see, it's starting to. It's just starting to take it into that knot. And your fingers are really important that you the spin doesn't go up into here. You only want it to go here. Look, we want to get this part full of spin. Now, I'm just going to give that a little tiny pull and we're going to move and we're going to pull slightly. You see that spin travelling up there? Do a little bit more. Now, this is a technique that I've seen um, Clara Sherman do. There's a lot of spin in there, look. I'm going to draw it out a little bit more. Okay, too much. And then just give it a very slight pull like that. And you'll be absolutely amazed at how, how strong that is. Then, keeping always keep that pinched. We're going to unroll the leader, take it down low, and start winding the bobbin and we want the wool to go on low because it adds to the weight of the spin getting started is always a little bit of a my good spin is sort of about there so actually i'm not going to wind on all the way i'm just going to your good spin where it's spun to that's good take that to the top of your at the top of your spindle start over here and just start that again and also As long as you're always holding that bit where the spin is, you don't want the spin to fly off down the spindle. Give that a little thumb pull. I can show you that again because it's really interesting. Just give it a little. about there that's where my spin ended and then carry on Now, this type of spin gives you a really um, even yarn and specifically it was spun for rug weaving and you can use it single, it's called a single, or you can ply it, um, double or chain ply it, which is also called Navajo ply, in th into three, which is what I really enjoy. Um, at the moment using so look you can see that it's, can you see how that's bouncing up and down look like that the guitar string you can actually see it in the film so you want all that spin to find its way into the yarn 
don't want to overreach, so just do a little bit at a time. Where you finished, bring that up level with the top. Depending on the yarn or the wool that you use, um, depends on how you handle it. So something very soft and silky when you're pra practicing and you're just starting is a little bit frustrating because it can it can pull apart very quickly and it can be quite slippy. So something that's actually a bit more rustic or a bit more has a bit more texture to it is is best. Any um, native. Um, British wool um, seems to be quite textured. This is South Downs. It's very short textured and it's really good for rugs. Um, so what you want to be looking for is roving um, and avoiding roving that is um, has ethical questions like animal welfare and where was it produced and how was it produced, you know, um, were the animals treated well. I think that's something to think about. Um, so look, we've gone to come down just to the last little bit. So what we want to do is you want to maybe have two, three inches that you split that in two, just very gently open it. Then you take another split section that we already did, and the end is sort of pointy-ish. Pop that right in the middle of the two, and then fold the two around it. And then give that just a tiny little pull. And then, just keep spinning. And the spin will just go right over that join. Okay, the join is, is in there. And I'm just going to show you how much spin is in there. And then when you wind it on your bobbin, you keep it nice and don't let it go all curly. Keep it nice and tight and you spin it on tight. And that keeps that keeps it under tension. Spin it to where that just finished. You might want to wear an apron. <laughs> I normally wear an apron, but I thought I would uh, <laughs> not today for some reason.
so if you pour this too, too well, if you leave it too thick, you, it just doesn't make a very nice yarn. But if you pull it too skinny, you might risk breaking it. But see how thin I can go? This bit's quite thin here. I show you just how skinny you can go um, with yarn. Also, if that starts to creep away and you haven't got much on your lap, you just have to bring that a little bit closer. It gives you more height. So, yeah, look, I can go a little bit skinnier. Yeah. Look at that spin. That's all this, every time you've turned it, it's put all that spin into it. Wind it on and keep that tension nice, keep it low. when you learn any new skill just take your time there's no reason why your first batch of yarn should be perfect because it probably won't be but what's what does that even mean what's perfect you know um, don't don't set yourself an impossible um idea of what it should look like just let it be what it is and then the more you practice as you can see how simple it is the more that you practice the more that signature of you will come through and you'll be able to handle the tool and the yarn and you're you're mediating the two and have that conversation. Okay, so I'm just going to sit and spin for a little while and by watching the technique and spinning along hopefully um, you're going to get a better idea of how just how it is, how it all flows and then um, learn by doing and learn by following along.
you've seen my work, you'll know that I really like texture, and I think variegated texture um, is just really interesting to me because it's about the energy of the spin uh, in the moment. Um, if you like, really like everything to be completely like the same, you know, that's your completely your prerogative, and um, you'll find a way to perfect. <laughs> Not that anything is perfecting, but you'll find a way to express um, how you would rather have your spin be. Um, by spinning in a way that is um, the most conducive to your peace of mind and pleasure. So this is the fourth piece of that split. So one about one meter about one meter of roving gave us four meters because we split it down. Areas where the um, areas where the join was it can be a little bit bulky. So if you want to give it a little form, I actually don't see it as a problem. Um, you can just concentrate a bit more spin into that. The spin and give it a little pull. You can probably tell by now that you can uh, while away many hours um, spinning in this way. Um, it's very relaxing and meditative. Um, if you have a mindfulness practice or a prayer practice, um, it's just something very calm to do. Um, you can do it outside. I even taken this spindle to the beach and sat and spun on the beach. Um, just sat on the floor. You know, totally make craft part of your life. Um, I think that's really important. That it can move with you and be with you and support you as well, not just financially. And if you're making work to sell, but for me, it's about um, mental health, well-being, sense of satisfaction, sense of artistic expression, and also, you know, humans have been spinning yarn on sticks like this for. <laughs> Thousands and thousands of years. So there's something very um, raw and honest and calming about handcraft and um, something as simple as spinning a wall around a stick. And for me, what makes this my favourite spindle um, design is. The contact with the floor, the sense of being grounded, and then the contact with the body as well. There is sort of a sense of um, grounding and balance and calm. <laughs> that can sometimes happen. So I went too skinny. I went too skinny. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open that up. So we just take off that tight little bit. Oh, I can open that. Open it up. I think we'll just take out that section. So 
we want that fluff because the fluff will join to fluff. If it's too tight, it won't it won't join. So I'm just going to work my um, fingers over that join. I think I, I let my yarn go a little bit skinny there, but I think that's joined it acceptably. So I want to um, show you the next section. If you want to rewind and watch this section through again of, of the spinning technique, I would recommend doing that a few times and then spinning along with me because that is, that is the basic technique. The next I'm going to show you is spinning on the other spindle from Pete, the walnut spindle that he made me. And then I'll show you how to take the yarn off the spindle using a tool called a nidi noddy. That is the next step. So I just want you to get comfortable with spinning and um, how that looks. Okay, so I'm going to show you up close. So I'll see you in the next section. Maybe go make yourself another cup of tea. Okay, welcome back. So I hope you've got a cup of tea. Um, I want to show you this spindle. Um, this is by Pete at Bodrigi, and he made it out of walnut wood. This is a beautiful spindle, and this is the wool W H O R L that I showed you earlier. That um, you can twist it off, Ooh. and um. This is yarn that I've been spinning on this um, to test it out. Um, Pete's a fellow member of the Heritage Crafts Association, the HCA. So if anyone feels like they want to check that website out as well, they explore um, traditional crafts. So um, Pete's a wood turner. Um, it just happens that he makes spinning uh, equipment as well. So there's a lot of crossover there. And I know a lot of um, Romani um, craftspeople um, do traditional craft and I, I think um, the Heritage Crafts Association is a wonderful organisation for supporting that. So I'm not going to use a spinning bowl for this because this is a nice heavy spindle. Um, this yarn that I'm spinning is a very special wool. It comes like this, it looks quite cobwebby. Um, it's from North Ronaldsey um, which is um, up in the um, Orkney Islands um, and these sheep only eat seaweed so it's incredibly soft incredibly soft and um, it smells beautiful and it comes in all the shades of grey of the sea stones um, so if anybody's read my book The Selkie um, this is the sheep that I refer to in that folk story it's wonderful. So it already comes pre-drafted. So this is very delicate. So this is much more delicate than the wool that I was using. So I really barely, barely pull it because it's it's so delicate. Um, I'm going to spin a little bit of this for you just to show you how this spindle works. So do it exactly the same way. Split split the end. Pop the point in. So this naturally spins finer because it's less bulky, um, which just means that um, I get a different, you know, different style yarn, different texture. Every kind of sheep gives you a different yarn texture. This, this is the, <laughs> this is the next piece of equipment that I'm going to show you about. It's called a niddy noddy, and you'll see why in a second. So a nice heavy um, spindle is it just has a slightly different feeling. Um, it's really beautifully made, and I always um, advocate um, supporting independent craftspeople um, who make uh, 
the equipment that you might need. So, um, I won't do too much on this, but I just wanted to show show you how it was. And, um, how it swings. And because this is heavier and tapered when it's on the floor, it doesn't really move around a lot. The other, as you saw with the other one, it's lighter and the bowl kind of accommodates that movement, whereas this is heavier and it doesn't tend to move when I'm spinning on it. So, I'm just going to get to that point, I think, and I'm going to end it there for now. So I'm just going to take it off. So I'm going to show you how you get your yarn <laughs> off your spindle and looking like... Um, and from one of the earlier videos, um, you'll know that this is called a skein. Um, and you can put this around the back of two chairs and unwind it and make it into a ball of wool. Um, but this is a skein. So how do we go from this to this without getting in a big tangle? Well, that's what I'm going to show you now. So let's just get my hand out of the way. You can do this in a couple of different ways. You can do it using a cardboard box or... Uh, I'm going to take the, um, the wool out of my wool basket, put it over there, um, and take my wool basket, I'm actually put this next to me, so what you're going to need, first of all, you need to get yourself a nitty noddy, when it arrives, it looks like, watch this, that. So all you need is a bar with two ends, because they can be straight, they can have a notch in them, they can have a peg on the end, doesn't really matter. But what you want to do is keep one uh, um, vertical and then you want to turn the other one horizontal. So you've got two, two completely different angles, right angles to each other. Got that right. And it's important because when you're winding the skein, you use it, you do this. Niddy, noddy, niddy, noddy. So I'll show you how we do that. First of all, um, I use this wool basket, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the spindle through the two handles. Get that in the camera shot. Um, to, to hold it in place. If you had a cardboard box, you could stick holes in the cardboard box and stick it through. We don't need to take the wall off for this. The wall, like the other one's fixed wall anyway. That's not important. Um, that's more for transport. So get something where you can put your spindle between two points. Just going to balance mine there. Now, um, little bits of thread are good. Um, You maybe want them to be about 10 centimetres long, so I just cut a few of those. I find I have a lot of sort of old broken leaders and bits of string. I keep them to one side just for, for these moments. So the Nidi Noddy has two notches in the middle. Sometimes they don't, just they don't, don't have to have the notches. The notch is there to help you. So take the end. You, you always lose a bit in, in um, yarn so don't worry about a fluffy end go for the bit that actually looks like yarn because that's going to be strongest and just do a gentle couple of knots or a knot and a half hitch um, because you want you're going to untie that at the end so take your hand and pop it around the middle of the nitty noddy under over, under, over. Make sure your hand's in the right position, okay? Okay. 
So the actual movement is the niddy noddy niddy noddy. <laughs> it doesn't like that. Sorry guys, okay. There we go. Okay. Go go your at the pace that you feel comfortable. If you accidentally cross here and go around the wrong piece, you, I would go back and fix it because that what that does is it gets your skein in a horrible tangle to start with and you don't want that. So it always goes around the outside and your arm just moves the niddy noddy around like up and down, niddy noddy, niddy noddy, niddy noddy. It's kind of hypnotic. Um, and you just keep going until you've used up all your bobbin. Okay. This is um, why, okay, oh, there's the end. This is why you end up losing some of your leader. So I don't want to cut my yarn. Um, so I take it up to here. And I snip the leader and I give it about... 10 centimeters because I'm going to use that as a tie. So you want to do at least four ties. I've tried to tie just two ends and that still tangles. So this is the leader and this is the end. Don't worry about the end because it's not finished yet. Um, wrap it around. Wrap it around that whole bunch there and do two good knots. The lead is not precious. It's there to help you. So if you want to reuse the leader, tie it in a bow, but if it, this isn't the best bit of end yarn, so when I've finished with it, I will cut it off and throw that bit away. Then, before I deal with this middle section, I'm going to take three um, of the, I'm going to sit back up here, I'm going to take three of those threads that I um, cut earlier, and because you've got four four sections so that's tied if for whatever reason you thought this wasn't going to hold or this bit of little bit of end yarn was fragile just put another tie around um this one's going to go into this arm so i'm not going to deal with that right now i'm going to do these two here so at the bare minimum do four ties so that's the second tie now it doesn't have to be tight to death like this. It's just to hold it together away from the other parts because this is going to be soaked in, in um, hand warm water, not hot, not cold, warm water. And if these weren't tied together in the water, they all start to sort of blend into each other and that, that can tangle your yarn and actually damage your spinning. So you've spent all this time spinning it's really good to honor that so you just tie loosely to that's not going to come off and it gives this yarn space to open up slightly in the water without tangling up with the rest of the yarn now the last one again depending on the yarn that you've used i just gently untie that if i had to cut it if my knot was too tight i would cut it I'd, Again, it all depends how you feel about your yarn. If, if it's kind of super, super precious and you want to use every last inch of it. So see that's now open. And I use that to tie itself to itself. I, I wouldn't, I'd probably take that off actually, that very fluffy end, that's just going to come out in the water. So I take it and I do two knots. Again, not mega tight. These are just holding mechanisms. Now, if I doubted that, that was going to hold, I would just take another bit of fabric and just a um, bit of yarn and just do a very simple um, tie next to it. So that is your, your skein, niddy nodded off the spindle, ready to soak. So it's under a little bit of tension, so I'm just going to pop it off. Now, watch what happens. So, see how it's sort of twisted up on itself. This is that's all the energy 
from the spinning is still in the yarn. It's nice and balanced, it's not not overspun, there's not like lots of twisting up and bouncing everywhere, it's quite nice and even. That needs to go and soak in um, a bowl of hand warm water for about half an hour. What that does is it allows the spin and the energy to dissipate into the water, it allows the fibres to open and soak, and then you hang it up to drip dry, let gravity and the water, you see that bounce? If we were knitting, that wouldn't be a problem. Bounce is actually quite um, a good quality in a knitting yarn, but in a weaving yarn, we don't want too much bounce. So we want to we want to use the water and gravity to take that bounce out. So what I do is I put a hook and either a teacup or I have some um, ceramic weights now that my friend Lily made me and just let that hang. And while it dries over a day or two, you don't want it to take too long to dry because you don't want it to start to smell damp. But let it dry, drip dry, and then put it near a radiator when after about a day after all the all the um, spin's been weighted out of it um, and, and then hang it over a, a dryer or near a radiator I wouldn't put it directly on a radiator um, but I'll show you the difference between this one and one that I have um, actually I'll show, you, I'll show you the difference between three so this is straight off the bobbin this one's been soaked but not weighted it, it was just soaked and then left to dry as it is now that still has quite a lot of bounce in it. And then this one has been um, soaked and weighted. And I think you can see how different that is to that one that didn't get weighted, bouncy, not bouncy. And then this, I'll, I'll just get rid of that one for now. This one that's straight off the um that's the difference okay so you're going to need to wait a day <laughs> until it's dry to actually use it but it's you can see how so look at the difference in the length so that the length is in there it's just it's just caught up in spin okay so these are the same these are essentially the same um size okay Got them in my hand here at exactly the same level. So that spin is in there, but what we need is it for it to come out and settle, settle into its finished length, which is like this. There's no bounce left in that look. Because if we wove with this now under tension on a loom, it might look great, but we always wet soak the weaving and all of that um, stretch and bounce would um, create havoc because it would want to bounce back in your weaving and so you get a weaving that kind of moves whereas if you've already prepared the yarn you know with some confidence that there, there's no surprises that that's going to suddenly spring back on itself and tighten your weaving in a way that you don't want it to. So that's why you would do that step. I hope that makes sense. Um, I will include some pictures of um, how we soak and weight that um, to get it to look like this. Well, that's the end of the workshop. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to um, present 
um, the style of spinning to you. Thank you to Isaac at Rimini Arts and um, I really hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, check out my blog post for all the links to all the materials and all the teachers that I've um, talked about, the Navajo, Diné um, spinners. Um, because learning, they taught me um, and studying them has taught me spinning. So um, in this way, on this spindle, and I think it's just a really good place to, to, to start is to go back to the source of, of those teachings. Um, well, all I can say is um, enjoy spinning, good luck, and um, I'm sure we'll find some way of um, seeing how you've got on and um, maybe let Isaac know um, how, you, how you're getting on with your spinning. Um, until next time, See you soon. Bye.